You're in church. We're in a church, Reza. I know. Wow, listen to my voice. It's really, Can you sound you... like God. The, I do, I do. <laughs> Tell that to my wife, please. <laughs> um, this is my better side. Do you want to switch? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I drink out of that. Thank you. That was very oh, thoughtful I, of you. It's definitely your better, better side. Right? Yeah. Can you tell? Uh, I don't know. Do I talk to these people? I guess I'll just talk to you a little bit. How's it going? It's, um, I'm good. This, I'm is, really well. this yeah. is one of the strangest things I've ever done. Yeah. So there's that. And I think that this is really cool that this is a church in Beverly Hills that would have a Baha'i talk to a Muslim about Jesus. I know. And... Yeah. Well done. They're Episcopalians. Yeah. So... Come and on, what is that? That's Polish? Is that a... <laughs> I don't, I don't I think, know from I think the denominations. Like fake Catholic, right? It's oh, fake Catholic. that's mean. I had the good fortune of meeting uh, your former roommate, Nate. And I was trying to get the scoop on you. Oh, man. And so my first question for you is about the band oh, Pike. Oh, man. Yeah. Tell us about Pike. Yes, well, it's true. I mean, I think a lot of, a lot of people know because of the, the, the talks that I've been giving in the book that when I was 15 years old, I, I met Jesus and, and had this... Uh, conversion experience to evangelical Christian Christianity. What is less known, and thank you for bringing it up, uh, is that then I started a, a Christian rock band, and we were yeah, and you know we were we were we were pretty popular. We were pretty good in our in our little world. We sang we sang songs. See, this is the thing: is that we sang songs that could could have been about a girl, could have been about Jesus. Yeah. You know? Van Morrison does that. True. Brown Eyed Girl is about Jesus. Yeah. 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 But um, thank you. Thank you for that embarrassing. Would you sing some Pike for us? <laughs> no. What, what did you play? No. Shut up. Uh, I, I was the um, lead singer. I was the lead singer. You and, were. Uh, and the uh, rhythm, rhythm guitarist. So you got some pipes on you. Not anymore. No, not anymore. That was, was there an incredible. album? My voice changed. Two albums. Two albums. I will pay you a thousand dollars for those albums. I might find one somewhere. I might find someone. Fantastic. It's actually a. Um, it's kind of a medieval halberd weapon. Okay, I, I can't believe we're having this conversation, but that's actually what I named it after. Yeah. I named it after a Pike Square. Okay, this has nothing to do with Jesus. Let's just get. Let's just. Let's just get into it. So a Pike Square. Mm -hmm. as you know, is in, in olden times, in ye olden days. They still have them in the Vatican, they, by the way. Right. So, right, the, a pike is this long spear mm -hmm. with, uh, with a, uh, like a knife at the end of it. Mm -hmm. And the way that they used to fight is by creating a pike square. So there would be like a square of soldiers like this, each one of them sticking their, their pikes out, and that's how they would move in the battlefield. Um, and there's this term called Running Through the Pikes. And it was, it's an ancient, ancient uh, saying about, it literally meant like being able to run through a pike square. And but it, what it meant was going through an impossible situation and coming out, uh, you know, in one piece. Mm. And that's sort of what I thought like being in a band would be like. So I named the band Pike. <laughs> True story. I don't think I've ever actually said that before, but it's a true story. Uh, since we're on this topic, and we'll get to, we'll get to Jesus, and <laughs> we'll get plenty of time to talk about uh, him, this, your story is absolutely fascinating for people that may not know about uh, the story of a Persian refugee family living in a motel. <laughs> in what city? Enid, Oklahoma. In Enid, Oklahoma and a young Persian boy of somewhat Muslim, somewhat agnostic background, finding Jesus. Uh, tell us a little bit about that experience. 
But yeah, well, you know, when we, we left Iran in 1979, um, like so many other Iranians after the revolution, and my dad had always been a firm unbeliever. I mean, he was kind of very, he was very uh, a devout atheist, as I like to, to put it. In fact, in, in Iran, he was quite infamous for the, uh, the, the sort of uh, files of Prophet Muhammad jokes that he would have, uh, and that he would, he would sort of release in very inappropriate times. Um, uh, and my mother was, you know, culturally Muslim, the way that most Muslims, the way that most people of any religion are. It was part of her identity, part of her ethnicity. And when we came to the States, obviously the 1980s, not a great time to be Muslim or Iranian in, in, in the United States, as opposed to now. <clears throat> so much better. And, uh, and we, you know, we sort of, we kind of scrubbed our lives of any kind trace of Islam, any trace of God, uh, as a means of just kind of fitting in. And so I didn't really grow up with any kind of religious instruction at all, but I'd always been a deeply spiritual boy. I mean, I've, I've, been, I've always had this deep interest in God. I think part of it had to do with my experiences of revolutionary Iran. I mean, seeing the power that religion has to transform a society for good and for bad. Even at seven years old, I understood what was happening. I, I, I sensed what was taking place. The energy was impossible not to feel. And I felt like I really didn't have any outlet for it until I was 15 years old and started going to something called Young Life, which is this Christian youth group that started in the 70s in the sort of the heyday of the Jesus is just all right by me days, you know? Mm -hmm. And what Young Life does is that they go to high schools and they uh, get like high school kids to come to these meetings where you sing songs and play games and have fun. And then at the end, they give you just a little bit of the gospel. And that kind of whetted my appetite. I went to a, a, a Young Life camp and it was there that I first heard this story, this, I mean, the greatest story ever told, this, I, this notion that the God of the heavens and earth became a man, became a baby, and then became this man, and then was uh, crucified for all of our sins, and that if we just believe in his name, if we, if we give our life to him, that, that we too can have eternal life, this just blew my mind and instantly became a devout Christian, went back home, tried to convert my family. My dad thought I was insane. Um, my mom thought it was weird for a while and then thought it wasn't so weird and then converted to Christianity um, at, as, as a result of, of, of my preaching. And then you know, I did what sort of most people in my, in my situation uh, do. I, I went to college and I started studying the New Testament from a historical perspective with these great Jesuits uh, for, at Santa Clara University. And right away, I noticed this disconnect that, that what I was learning about this person, this man who lived 2,000 years ago in a land called Palestine, and what I'd been taught about him in church were not the same, that they were different things. And I, and I understand, I mean, Christians believe that, that Jesus is fully God and fully man, and, and, it, and the, the, the foundation of Christian orthodoxy is that they are sort of one united being, and that's what I believed. But the more I studied the historical Jesus, the more they separated for me and became two distinct beings. And the fact of the matter is, is that I became much more interested in this guy, the, the person and the world in which he lived and the powers that he confronted and the way that he sacrificed himself for the poor and the marginalized, the weak, the dispossessed, than I was of this guy who, at least as I was taught about him, was this kind of you know, detached, celestial spirit without any care for the, for the world uh, that is, whose only concern was the other world. And that became sort of the, the foundation for this book. When I heard that you were writing this book and I read about it online or something and I emailed you and I remember saying like, send me the book right away. I can't wait to read it because I'm, 
it's, it's interesting, as a Baha'i, we certainly, as a, I uh, can't speak for all of us, but the Baha'i faith believes that in the divinity of Christ. Right. And I, growing up not Christian, I've always just been fascinated by Jesus and his story and the, especially the history of the church and its various diversions and the Nicene Creed and, uh, and Paul and, and uh, uh, James and... Uh, so I've, I've, I've had a hunger. I've read many, many books you can ask my wife about, uh, Early Jesus and the History of Christianity. And so I was really gratified to get your book and, and dig in. And I thought you made some uh, really beautiful points. But how did, um, what happened in your estimation that made Jesus uh, this kind of detached, deified, celestial yeah. figure and took him away from the historical Jesus. This deeply Roman religion about a, a detached demigod. And it has, I think, less to do with anything that Jesus himself said or did, though his words and actions were extraordinary, remarkable. I mean, he was a, an incredibly charismatic man, and the, and the message that he preached was both profoundly appealing to the sector of society that he represented and incredibly threatening to the political and religious powers of the time. So threatening that he was ultimately arrested, uh, tried, tortured, and executed as a state criminal. But the transformation happened after that event, right? The transformation happened when Jesus' followers refused to do what the followers of every other failed Messiah refused to do, which is to go home. Let me unpack that statement for a moment because I, I understand that it's, it, it might be a little bit troubling. And, and there's an interesting scenario right there, which is after Jesus was risen, there's about maybe some say 50 believers in Jesus around at that time? Probably about 50, 60. Hanging like out outside no of Jerusalem, 70. like what do we do now? How does it move right. from that? There were all these other failed messianic movements. Um, how does it move from that to... Uh... Let me just explain what I mean by failed messiah. The first thing that you need to know about the world in which Jesus lived is that there were many messiahs. Okay, I, I write about 12 of them. And Many of them were way more successful than Jesus was. They were, some of them were actually named in the New Testament. Uh, they had more followers than, than Jesus did. But, and, each, and every one of them, by the way, had the same fate as Jesus. Each one of them was ultimately killed by Rome for claiming to be the Messiah. And that's because Messiah meant something very specific in Jesus' time. There were a number of views about what, what Messiah meant. It was, you know, it, there was some folklore and, and hero tales as well as the, the Hebrew Bible. But essentially there was consensus about a couple of things about the Messiah. The Messiah means the anointed one. The job of the Messiah as the descendant of King David is to recreate the kingdom of David on earth to usher in the reign of God on earth. Well, if you are ushering in the reign of God on earth, you are ushering out the reign of Caesar. And so simply saying the words, I am the Messiah, is a treasonable offense in first century Palestine. But the, the fact of the matter is that according to the Jewish interpretation of Messiah, and it turns out that Jesus was a Jew, so he probably had a Jewish interpretation of it. Jesus was as successful in uh, fulfilling the messianic functions as the Jews understood them as any of these other failed messiahs. I mean, according to Jewish law, scripture, and tradition, a dead messiah is no longer the messiah. I mean, that's as simple as that. And every one of these other messiahs who were killed by Rome, their movements collapsed instantly. Their followers just went home. That was it. The end, end of the story. But Jesus' followers did not. They claimed to have had this ecstatic experience, right? The risen Jesus. And however you want to judge that statement, it's a statement of faith, any, anyway, it's, it's, it's a matter of faith. The fact of the matter is that that belief, that statement, compelled them to keep going, 
And not just to keep going, but to redefine what the Messiah was, to rethink what it meant to be the Messiah, to refashion the Jewish concept of Messiah into something else, something truly unique. But some of that was Jesus' doing. I mean, he did command his disciples to go forth and spread his word and to keep it going, even though he knew he was going to his death. Well, that is certainly what the Gospels say. And people, and you know, can take that however they want to. I mean, it's perfectly fine to, to believe that, you know, everything in the gospel is actually true, but... So you're I, saying there's a possibility that Jesus did not command his followers <laughs> to go forth and spread his message? I'm saying this, that just because it's in the gospels doesn't necessarily mean it happened. The gospels were written... Well, the first gospel, Mark, was written in 70, so about 40 years after Jesus' death. Matthew and Luke were written sometime between 90 and 100, so, you know, 60, 60, 70 years later. John was written somewhere between 100 and 120, so about, you know, 70 to, to 80, 90 years later. And they were written by people who already believed that Jesus was God, right? That was the, that was where the first thought. Jesus is, you know, the literally begotten Son of God. Now I'm going to write about him. And when they wrote their Gospels, what they were doing was not writing what we would, today would refer to as history, right? The idea of history as a, an accumulation of empirically verifiable facts is a product wholly of the modern age. That definition of history is like 300 years old. For them, they were writing... A, a theological doctrine, right? This was, this was a, an, an argument that they were making. Uh, the, it was a proof text. And the, the, the prep, proposition that they were proving was that this Jewish peasant from the low hills of Galilee is God incarnate. So we have to read the Gospels with that understanding in mind, that these are not historical documents, they're theological affirmations of faith written by communities of faith. They are an argument, not a chronicle. But I can understand that someone taking a more academic or historical viewpoint of the, of the New Testament could say, well, did he really turn loaves into fishes and water into wine, and did this really happen, and blah, blah, blah. But to say that the conversations, which were multiple, of Jesus saying, go forth and spread my word, is possibly didn't happen, is an interesting yeah. take. Uh, let, let me just clarify that I'm not saying it didn't happen or it did happen. Uh, I, I am saying one very important thing. Those statements of Jesus in choosing 12 of his apostles and giving them power to go and preach in his name, in, in spreading his message out uh, were statements in the Gospels before he died. What you're referring to is this very famous statement of Jesus after he was resurrected and right before he is ascended up into heaven. And right before he does so, he tells his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations. And then he is risen up into heaven. And it, that's a perfectly fine belief if you believe that that happened or not. But what I'm saying is that the Jesus who had this three-year ministry um, and who probably knew that that ministry was going to end in death. I mean, it doesn't really take a prophet to figure out that if you are challenging the greatest empire the world had ever seen, you're probably going to end up on a cross. Didn't he refer to it in, the, in, in some of his teachings? Often. Of his of his imminent death and his Often. ultimate sacrifice. He knew he was going to make this great sacrifice. In fact, this is really interesting, going back to this question of, of uh, a historian's take on the Gospels as opposed to a faith-based take on the Gospels. A lot of historians say that uh, these, these multiple statements of Jesus predicting his own death, predicting uh, the, the cross, uh, can be discounted because... You know, these Gospels were written so many years after the crucifixion, and, you know, the people who wrote them knew that the, that the story ends on a cross, and so they just put those words into Jesus' mouth. I'm not sure if that's the case, because the sheer volume of Jesus' statements about his impending death 
are such that it's very likely that there is some historicity to them. But again, I have to go back to this one fundamental fact. Historicity is not a word. It's, I, did I just make that it's word not up? not a word. You People almost just fooled them. Yeah. You, almost, you um, almost fooled them. Is that, that I don't think it, it takes a prophet or a messiah to understand where the path that Jesus was, was walking on leads. There were many other messiahs in his day and age who healed the sick, cast out demons, gathered disciples, call, call, you know, talked about the, the, the coming of the kingdom of God, and they all ended up at the end of, of the road in, in, you know, dead, either crucified or the, with their heads chopped off. So for Jesus to say to his disciples, if you want to follow me, pick up your cross and, and follow me, I think Christians view that statement as a statement of self-abnegation, which is a word. Um, that it's a, it's, a, it's a statement of self-denial, right? Pick up your cross is about self-sacrifice. No, Jesus meant it quite literally. We are heading towards Jerusalem to take on the representative of the empire and the representative of the Jewish cult, the high priest. We're all going to die. Okay? We're, we're going to end up on a cross because that's where this journey ends. So you want to follow me? Pick up your cross and follow me. The title of your book is Zealot. So what does that word mean and why would you describe Jesus as one? Yeah. Zealotism was a widespread biblical principle in Jesus' time. It actually has its basis in a, in a biblical doctrine called zeal that, that you find throughout the Hebrew scriptures. By the way, when I say Hebrew scriptures, I mean the Old Testament, but that's a, you should refer to it as the Hebrew scriptures, not the Old Testament, uh, because it's kind of offensive. Um, the Hebrew scriptures talk about all the great heroes and prophets and kings of old as being zealous for the Lord. Zeal itself has its core in the definition of God. God refers to himself in the Hebrew Bible repeatedly as a jealous God, a devouring fire, a God who abides no partner, who will not stand for uh, the worship of any other God but him. And the idea of zeal in Jesus' time became this principle that could be best defined as an uncompromising devotion to the sole sovereignty of God, a refusal to serve any master, any human master certainly, but any master at all except for the Lord of the universe, and a total devotion to the Torah, the law of Moses, um, which ultimately, you know, the consequences of that belief is a desire to cleanse the holy land, this land that God set aside solely for his chosen people of the, the abomination of the Roman occupation. Almost, I mean, the vast majority of Jews in Jesus' time would have proudly referred to themselves as zealous for the Lord. It's, it's, a, it's a term of devotion. But there were some Jews who took the idea of zealotry to its next level and, and said, well, if this is what you believe, then you have to fight against the Roman occupation. I mean, the core ideal of zealotry is the cleansing of this land. And many of those zealots took, took up arms against Rome. Some of them took up arms against the Jewish aristocracy. Uh, but not all of them in, you know, were, were violent revolutionaries. But the idea of be, calling yourself a zealot at that time meant being a rebel against the state. And what I'm arguing in this book is that the sentiments of zealotry are deeply embedded in Jesus' teachings and in his actions, and that indeed he himself was a zealot and he was ultimately executed for his zealotism. I found it really interesting, your statement that crucifixion was a punishment reserved for treason towards the Roman state because we were often here growing up that he was crucified next to a robber and a thief and it was just a general form right. of, of punishment. Yeah. Of, uh, no, it's funny. I mean, I, I say this all the time that if you know nothing else about Jesus except that he was crucified, 
that fact alone should alter what you think of him as this kind of, you know, detached spirit, this kind of inveterate pacifist who turns the other cheek, who has no interest in, in the cares of this world. That Jesus, Rome couldn't care less about. If Rome thinks that you are such a, a threat to the state that they arrest you and crucify you, you are a badass. You are a troublemaker. Um, crucifixion, as you say. You can't say, say badass in church. church. No. <laughs> you are a bad butt. That doesn't work. Um, crucifixion was a punishment that Rome reserved exclusively for crimes against the state. In fact, crucifixion wasn't a capital punishment. It was often the case that Rome would kill you first and then crucify you. Crucifixion was a deterrent. That's why it was always done in public places, on hills, at, the cro at crossroads, in markets. I can relate because I've cities. done several movies where I've been <laughs> killed and then crucified. And then crucified, yeah. <laughs> Just and in the press more, it's, but go ahead. <laughs> And this thing, this thing, of, I've seen some of those movies, by the way, and this, this thing about the thieves alongside Jesus, it's true that in English we understand this word, uh, the Greek word lestis, which is used to describe these guys as thief, but lestis does not mean thief in Greek. Lestis means bandit, and bandit was the most common term in Jesus' time for an insurrectionist, for a rebel. In fact, there's this very famous moment where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and the soldiers come to arrest him. And Jesus says, have you come here with swords and clubs to arrest me like a lestis, like a bandit, uh, which is precisely how they viewed him. Um, so again, I mean, that, that if, you, if you really want to know who Jesus was, you should start at the end of the story with him on a cross, not at the beginning of it. And... Uh... Talk more about this. Uh, I found the last chapter of the book fascinating about the, the split between James and, and Paul and the church eventually, the Roman church headed more into the yeah. Paul, Paulist, Pauli, Paulism? Pauline, Paul, Pauline. Pauline. Yeah. Uh, no, this is, this is, I'm so glad you brought this up because people, most Christians know who Paul is, obviously. I mean, dude's got 14 letters in, in, the, uh, in the New Testament. Um, but they have no idea who James is. And James is unquestionably the most important person in the early church after Jesus' death. James is J Jesus' actual flesh and blood brother. Jesus had four brothers, as, as the Gospels say. And one of them, James, became Jesus' successor, became the head of what was called the Mother Assembly, the, the church in Jerusalem which was then in charge of all the other assemblies or churches that propped up in like Philippi and Corinth and Galatia and you know, Antioch and Alexandria and Rome. The mother assembly was, was the head assembly. Was, James was referred to as the bishop of bishops. And you can see this in Acts. You can see it in Paul's letters. Paul is constantly referencing James, the brother of Jesus, the, James, the brother of our Lord. A, in Acts, James, along with the, the sort of the tripartite leaders, James, Peter, and John, is quite clearly in charge of, of you know, the, the, this whole movement. Um, but James's story starts to get scrubbed away from the, the, the history of early Christianity because his view of Christianity was of a Jewish religion founded by a Jewish Messiah for Jews. James was okay if non-Jews wanted to be Christians. That was fine with him, as long as they became Jews first. Uh, and, you know, after a while, after a few years, he, he you know, forgave the, the, the requirement of, of circumcision, which I'm sure a lot of people were grateful for. Um, but as far as James was concerned, this is, this is not a new religion. This is Judaism, but we believe Jesus was the Messiah, and if you want to follow us, you have to follow the law of Moses down to the letter, as he says in, in his own letter in the, in the Gospel, I mean, in the New Testament, James. Paul, who never wasn't an, you know, a, a disciple of Jesus, never actually knew Jesus, never met Jesus, but has this ecstatic experience of the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus and 
this, this experience compels him to, to uh, become a follower of, of this new religion, has a total opposite view of this religion than James does. Paul says, Christ is the end of the Torah, that the law of Moses is, has been superseded by the resurrection, that not only do you not have to be a Jew to be a Christian, but that Judaism itself uh, ha has been swept aside by, by Jesus' death and, and resurrection. And he begins preaching this gospel not to Jews, but to Gentiles, to non-Jews, and becomes fairly successful in doing so. So successful that James starts to notice. And we have these really amusing scenes in the book of Acts in which three separate times James uh, uh, you know, calls, spanks him. Yeah, spanks him. That's the best way to put it. Like, mm -hmm. summons Paul to Jerusalem mm -hmm. to answer for what he's saying, uh, excoriates him. And then the third time he does this actually forces Paul to publicly repent of his teachings by taking part in this really uh, restrictive, uh, severe, Jewish ritual at the temple, the same temple that Paul thinks has been made irrelevant by Jesus. During both men's lifetime, James is ascendant. In fact, once he excoriates Paul, he sends his own emissaries to all of Paul's communities around the diaspora to correct Paul's teachings. It's funny, if you read Paul's letters, you, you see this right away. I mean, most of Paul's letters are just begging his followers to not abandon him. Why are you abandoning me? Why, why, why are you, do not listen to any other gospel but the gospel that I am preaching. Do not listen to these wolves in sheep's clothing. Who do you think he's referring to? He's talking about, as he puts them, the so-called pillars of the church, which is Paul's words for James, Peter, and John. These two men loathed each other. They just absolutely hated each other. It's, 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 the, the hatred is dripping out of Paul's letters. He says that James means nothing to him, that he learned nothing from the apostles. Um, and frankly, again, during their lifetimes, Paul was the lesser of the two movements. I mean, you don't argue against the flesh and blood brother of Jesus, right? I mean, in any argument... James wins. So James says, yeah, I actually, like, we shared a room. I know. <laughs> I know what he meant. Mm -hmm. You don't. I win. But then something happens. James dies in 62. And then something happens four years later, which is these zealots, these Jews who, who are zealous for the Lord and who have been trying desperately for 100 years to get rid of the Romans, succeed. They actually rise up. They kick Rome out of Jerusalem. They hold them at bay for about three or four years. And then in 70, Rome returns. And when they return, they slaughter everybody. They burn the city of Jerusalem to the ground. They raise the temple of God and defile its ashes. What few surviving Jews there are, they, they kick out of the Holy Land forever. They make Judaism, the religion itself, pariah. In the, in, it's, the Jewish cult becomes no longer a legitimate cult in the Roman Empire. In fact, the Jews are now forced, if every Jew, man, woman, and child in the Roman Empire, is forced to pay uh, a fee every year for the upkeep of the central pagan deity of Rome, the, the Temple of Jupiter. And they rename the and they rename Jerusalem. Capitolina. Yeah, they rename Jerusalem Iola Capitolina. That's right. It becomes, from the center of uh, monotheism, it becomes the center of pagan That's right. worship under the Roman. For the Jews, this is the end of the world, as far as they're concerned. This is the end. I mean, the, their, their God has been defiled. The city of God, the footstool of God, has been raised to the ground. There are two things that you need to know about that, that moment, and that's why I'm bringing it up. Number one, in destroying the, the Jerusalem and the temple, they also destroyed the mother assembly, the original Christian church, and all trace of James's original community. Is that when the Nazis got the Ark of the Covenant? <laughs> that's right, that's where they found it. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
so, that, so that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing that you, you need to know is that every word ever written about Jesus in the Gospels was written after this event mm -hmm. and has to be seen in the context of this event. So the temple is gone, Jerusalem is gone, the mother assembly is gone, and Judaism is no longer a worthy religion. So what do these followers of Jesus do? They come to the very smart decision to instead start preaching this religion to the Romans and not to the Jews. And in doing so, they've got this perfect framework, Paul. Paul has been preaching Jesus to non-Jews since 50, you know, for 20 years. He's got all these letters that are, that are circulating around. His vision of Jesus as this eternal being, as God made flesh, is one that Romans can understand. I mean, a God man? That makes sense to a Roman. Caesar is a God man. Um, and that's how this provincial religion started by a Jewish peasant uh, in, in the, the backwoods of Galilee becomes a Roman religion that ultimately becomes the largest religion in the world. And there's an interesting point that you make in the book, which has to do with the difference uh, in Christianity as taught by Jesus and James being, well, I'm, I'm just gonna say Christianity, that it has to do with acts, um, that it has to do with serving the poor and um, taking charitable actions, and the Paulist idea of being, of just simply accepting Christ as the right. Lord made flesh, and as if you just do that in your heart, you're saved for all eternity. You don't that's actually what, have to do, says. you don't have to do anything. You just, you just take that. Right. Grace is free. Salvation is free. It's right. not about the things that you do. That's not how you can be saved. That salvation comes solely through Jesus' sacrifice. And your acceptance of that sacrifice, that's it. Wipes the slate clean and you are saved, which of course now we call Christianity. James had a completely different view. And there's this argument that you see going back and forth in James's letter and Paul's letter. In fact, they use the same metaphors in order to, to, to argue. They use the same stories from the Hebrew Bible. James literally refers to that view as the view of, an, of, an, of a non-sensible person. He says that that's an irrational view, that of course works matter. Yes, faith is important, but it's your works that define your faith. It's the things that you do, the, your actions that, that, uh, that sort of bring salvation uh, through, to fruition. He, he completely rejects the notion that it's just about believing in Jesus. In fact, James says this wonderful thing. He says, even, even, the, de even the demons believe and shudder. I mean, that's his view. Like, belief, that's it? Even the demons believe. It's not just about belief. It's about actions. It's about what you do. And for James, the single most important action was the, the care of the poor. In fact, James, his nickname was James the Just. That's how everyone referred to him, the Just One. JJ. JJ, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Or as my, as my wife Jessica calls him, Jimmy Christ. Um, <laughs> but what's, what's amazing is that we actually have evidence that the early Christian community, before they were called Christians, they weren't called Christians until about like the middle of the 40s, and it was in Antioch, the first place where they were actually called Christians. And don't forget, Christian was a derogatory term. You know, it was a term of abuse. It seems, however, that what they referred to themselves as was the poor. That's how they referred to themselves under James's tutelage. The mother assembly, it was like, are, are you among the poor? Are you one of the poor? They sold all their possessions. They gave everything away to the poor. They had everything in common. It, the entire ministry of James, as he understood Jesus's ministry, was single-mindedly focused on care for the poor, and by the way, against the rich. I mean, James, if you, James, in James's letter, 
the way he talks about the rich, I mean, he, he, he makes it clear there is no salvation for the rich mm -hmm. as far as James is concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, he, you know, he is What absolutely... would he think of Steve Carell then? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't. I mean, Dude's loaded. I think, we know, I think we know where he's going. Uh, what would you want... It's difficult to say Christianity because how many thousands of denominations yeah, sure. are there of Christianity. I mean, you go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and you can see 40 of them battling over every fighting. square inch of the, so of the Mother Church. But They each have their own, like, 12-minute interval where they can use the, the church. Where they can, yeah. what, uh, what would you say to, uh, what would you want today's church to glean from this book? And what ideas from this book would you like to see put into practice? That's a really good question. Um, I guess my, my hope for this book is, for non-Christians, my hope for this book is to understand that you could be a follower of Jesus without being a Christian, that you could take this man's words and actions as a model for your life. There are two people that I basically fashion my life after, Jesus and, and Jessica, and sometimes You've got the, anyway. Um, but, uh, so that's my, that's my hope for non-Christians. My hope for Christians is that, especially those who truly say they want to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, which is what, you know, what Christians want, right? They want to imitate Jesus. They want, they want to be like him. Well, if you want to be like Jesus, then you have to understand something very important. This is a man who, who owned a lot of guns. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and who hated gays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, guns and gays. That was, that was Jesus' entire ministry. Uh, no, this was a man who, in every case, was on the side of the individual instead of the institution. This was a man for whom power, by definition, was corrupted. This is a man who sacrificed his life fighting against the religious and political institutions uh, and who rejected the very notion that there could be a gatekeeper to salvation, which is what the priests were at that time, and who in every sense of the word was on the side of the poor against the rich, the weak against the powerful, uh, the, the hungry against the fed. So for those Christians out there who talk about Jesus in ways that either empower them politically or enrich them economically, that is not, that is not even, it's not just that that's not what Jesus preached, that's a betrayal of what Jesus preached. So that's what I hope. The, um, I guess the main... Okay. Hey, Jesus. That's cool. I guess a question that came up for me is, in this book, you describe Jesus as a revolutionary, as filled with a zeal, not only a, a religious fervor, but an a anti-Roman fervor, an anti-establishment fervor. He's almost like a, a community organizer, uh, <laughs> to quote the last election. Uh, but what's the difference in your mind between Jesus and Gandhi or mm. Cesar Chavez or Martin Luther King? Mm. Well, first all of all, of those things apply to them. Yeah. First of all, I do believe fervently that God speaks to many, 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 many people. It's the foundation of the Baha'i faith. That that if there is a God, that he is in a constant state of self-revelation, that he is in perpetual communication with his, with his creation, and that the people that we refer to as prophets are nothing more than receptacles for that, for that communication, and that Jesus is as valid a prophet as any other prophet uh, who... who speaks, you know, from that, that, that position, that mystical position. But that includes people like Gandhi. It includes people like Cesar Chavez. I mean, 
Do you think, think God that, speaks through Cesar Chavez? I think that people... That, he certainly wanted social justice yeah. and worked for the poor. Does yeah. that mean that God was speaking through him? I think that God was acting through him. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think that any human being who is willing to sacrifice himself for the marginalized and the dispossessed uh, is doing God's work. I think that poets and writers and artists and musicians are, are divinely inspired. Uh, I mean, I, I, if, if you are someone who believes, as I do, that God is everything, then you cannot separate creator from creation. They are one and the same. And therefore, any kind of ecstatic, transcendent experience, whether it's in the field of social activism or in music, to me, is an expression of the divine. Absolutely. Great. Well, we are going to open it up for some questions. Uh, I'd ask you to keep your questions short. I'm sure there's a number of people here who have a lot of extended comments they'd like to make, and I'm going to shut you up. Um, you can write a book, and I will come and MC it, and then we can talk about it when it's your time to be on the stage. But I'd love to hear what uh, questions you have for Mr. Aslan. Thanks, Rain. Typically, at this point, I remind people that questions start with a W or an H. Hi, I'm curious what your research pro process was for the book and if you came across any resistance in doing the research. Very good question. Um, as I was saying before, I mean, the, the problem with talking about the historical Jesus is that outside of the New Testament, there is almost no trace of this man, with the exception of a brief throwaway line in uh, a, a book called The Antiquities, written by a Jewish historian named Flavius Josephus, who was writing in Greek for a Roman audience. And Josephus, in a passage in which he is talking about far more important people, as far as he's concerned, uh, the Roman governor, the high priest, uh, mentions how at this one moment where the, there's a vacuum of power because the uh, Roman governor dies and, and the Jews are waiting for the new Roman governor to arrive from Alexandria, uh, the high priest, whom he refers to as this fiendish uh, Sadducee, decides that he's going to take advantage of this vacuum of power um, and start putting his enemies to death. And one of the people that he puts to death is this man named James. And this is how Josephus refers to James. James, the brother of Jesus, the one they call Messiah. That's it. That is it. That throwaway line, which for Josephus is quite clearly meant to be dismissive, the one they call Messiah. It's sort of like a, you know, the one they call Messiah. Um, and in any case, He's not even interested in Jesus. He's interested in James, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and also, he's not even all that interested in James. He's interested in the high priest. But that sentence becomes enormously significant because what it proves is that not only did this man actually exist, Jesus, but that by the year 94 CE, so 60 years after his death, his, the movement that he founded was large and significant enough that Josephus assumes that his audience is familiar with it. In fact, he's, he assumes his audience is so familiar with it that the way he tells you which James he's talking about is by referencing Jesus. James, you know James, that one guy whose brother was you know, this, the, this guy. That's very important. But other than that, that's it. We don't have anything else. So what I do instead is I rely on the world that Jesus lived in. And that world, we know almost everything about, uh, thanks to the Romans, who were very good at documentation. Uh, we know how much a bushel of wheat cost during Jesus' time. We know everything about the social, religious, and political world of first century Palestine. And so my methodology is pretty simple. Let's take those things that there is pretty much consensus about when it comes to Jesus. Number one, that he was a Jew. Number two, that he started a Jewish movement, the purpose of which was to establish the kingdom of God 
whatever that means. And number three, that Rome crucified him as a result. My argument is that if that's all that you know about Jesus, it's enough. You take that, you can call a person Bob and, and, and endow him with those three things and put him in this world and the biography kind of writes itself because a Jew who started a movement based on the kingdom of God who is crucified is a insurrectionist uh, at a time of insurrection. And then I go to the New Testament and I use some of the outlines, the basic stories of the New Testament, those that we can be fairly uh, historically certain of, and there's a whole bunch of tricks about how we do that. But ultimately what we do is we take the claims of the New Testament and we analyze them in light of the history that we know. And if it doesn't match that history, then we reject the claim. And I can give you a couple of just very, very brief examples of this. So, for instance, the infancy narratives, right? One infancy narrative, the Gospel of Matthew, says that in a vain search for Jesus, the baby Jesus, Herod the Great uh, kills all the first, firstborn sons. Herod the Great was the most famous Jew in first century Palestine. There were reams and reams of material written about Herod the Great. This event never happened. It never happened. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a mythological story meant to prove a truth about Jesus, which is that he is the new Moses. After all, Herod is the new Pharaoh. And so the same way that Moses escapes Pharaoh's slaughter of the Israelites' sons, Jesus escapes the slaughter uh, of, of Herod. Or another story, the, the, the trial before Pilate, right? In the Gospels, you have this moment in which Pilate, the Roman governor, is at great pains to, to release Jesus. He is utterly certain that Jesus is innocent. In fact, in the Gospel of John, he thinks Jesus is God. He thinks Jesus is the Son of God. And he tries everything in his power to convince the Jews to please, please, please let this man go. And the Jews say, absolutely not. Uh, we want him dead, and we will take the blame for it on our heads and our children's head and our children's children's head, the Jews say. And then so finally, poor Pilate has no choice but to just wipe his hands of the whole affair and reluctantly hand Jesus over to be crucified. We know a lot about Pontius Pilate, okay? He was one of the longest serving governors, the second longest serving governor uh, of Jerusalem. This was a brutal, bloodthirsty Roman's Roman who on a regular basis sent his troops out onto the streets of Jerusalem to slaughter the Jews when they disagreed with the slightest of his decisions. The idea that he would even spend a second's thought on yet another Jewish rabble-rouser standing before him, let alone that he would be forced by the Jews to crucify this innocent man, is not historical. So that's how we do it. We say, what does the gospel say? What does the history say? Do they match? And if they don't match, we reject the historicity of the Gospels. We don't re reject the truth of the Gospels. These stories were written not to reveal any kind of fact. They were written to reveal a truth about Jesus. The people who wrote the Gospels knew this didn't happen. They were only a generation or two removed from it. The people who read the Gospels when they were first written knew this didn't happen, but they didn't care because their idea of history is not our idea of history. They weren't looking for facts, they were looking for truths. Can someone quickly just Google historicity and just <laughs> see? It is a word. It's a word? Did you Google it or do you just think it was? Because For real? Okay. Is it a word like truthiness is a word? Yeah. How you doing? <clears throat> this question is for Professor Aslan. Uh, I want to know your opinions on uh, 
the transference from Baal and other deities in ancient Israel to Yahweh. And then a second question is, uh, can there be any hard, true research on Muhammad, how there is, you know, biblical research as there is now, or as it was in Germany and then mm -hmm. up to now? Well, you know, I mean, I, I wrote a book about the historical Muhammad, uh, my first book, No God But God, and I did the exact same thing. I took the claims of the early histories that were made about Muhammad and what little we know about Muhammad's world. We know far, far less about Muhammad's world than we know about Jesus's world because there were people in Jesus's world who wrote stuff down and there weren't in Muhammad's world. Um, and then, and then try to create a, a much more realistic version of who this person was and, and what, what he did with his world. So I, I, I did the exact same thing with Muhammad. Um, your first question, though, is way, way more complicated. And it goes into like some hardcore Hebrew Bible research. So I'm going to do it in the simplest way possible. The Bible in the Hebrew scriptures, right, the God, God, as he, in English, this is the problem, is that we're not reading the, 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 the Hebrew Bible in Hebrew, we're reading it in English. So it says, God came to uh, Abraham and said, I am God, and you shall worship no other God by, by, but me. Um, the problem, however, is that that's not what the Hebrew says. The Hebrew says, El, or Elohim, uh, uh, came to to, uh, uh, or El Shaddai, the El of the mountains. You know, he's always referred to as El in the Abrahamic uh, uh, narrative, uh, came to Abraham and, and told him, I am your God. Well, as you rightly say, El is the Canaanite God, which makes sense because Abraham lived in the land of Canaan. Um, and so Abraham wasn't a monotheist, he was a henotheist. He believed that El, his God, was the highest God, but not the only God. In fact, the sort of beautiful poetry of the Hebrew Bible where, you know, the prophets say, Oh God, you are the God the highest. They meant that literally. You are actually the highest God of all the other gods. Moses confronted a completely different God in the burning bush. That God who comes to, to Moses in English is referred to as God. But in Hebrew, he is not El, he is Yahweh, which is a completely different God. It's an Egyptian, uh, 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 like a war deity, an, an ancient Egyptian war deity, which makes sense because guess what? Moses was Egyptian. Uh, it is much, much later, and probably not until the, the, what's called the Babylonian exile, so around 586, BC, that these two deities, El and Yahweh, become El Yahweh and, and become a single deity. And what we now understand to be Jewish monotheism starts not with Moses or with Abraham, but in the Babylonian exile. That's as, that's as deep as I'm going to get into that because it, it gets much more complicated than that. <laughs> this guy here had his hand up. Sorry, I'm going to preempt you here. Reza, what about the other Gospels? Yeah. In other words, all the thing in the Hammurabi and everything yeah, yeah, that's yeah, been yeah. revealed, how does that fit into this story and your story? It's a very good question. Right. So as, as many of you probably have heard, there are more than four Gospels, right? There's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John were the Gospels that were canonized. But there were dozens of other Gospels that were, once the canon was formed in the middle of the fourth century, uh, they were banished, right? The, these Gospels all became heterodoxy. Um, and fortunately, some monk, sometime, who knows when, somewhere in the fourth or fifth centuries, managed to save these ancient documents and hide them uh, in a cave in Upper Egypt in a town called, in a village really, called Nag Hammadi. And we now, and, and in 1945, we accidentally found them. Uh, and these Gospels are often referred to as the Gnostic Gospels, but they include the Gospel of Thomas, which we already knew about, actually, before, before um, defined in Nag Hammadi. But the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of the Egyptians, the Gospel of Truth, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, a whole host of other uh, apocryphal letters, uh, 
Um, the script for Peter. Godspell? The script. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and, and what is amazing about these texts is that they prove what we've always known, which is that for the first four, five, six hundred years after Jesus' death, there were multiple interpretations of who he was. I mean, just vastly contradictory versions of who this man was, you know, from a human being, a Jewish rabbi, to an utterly ghostly figure without any kind of real corporal body, that, 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 that his body was just a figment of the imagination, that he was nothing but a ghost. Um, like Ghost Dad with Bill Cosby? Like, <laughs> well, that's, a, that's, a, that's, like, that's going back. That's a, that's a Bill Cosby uh, yeah. uh, reference. That's back. Um, but yeah, nonetheless, I mean, this is, this, they became enormously valuable in, in telling us about the history of the third, fourth, and fifth centuries. But they are absolutely not relevant whatsoever to a historical study of Jesus uh, because they were written much, much later, except for the Gospel of Thomas. Which but but some of those Gospels, were, I've read that some of them were charlatans saying like, I'm a Christian and I've had revelation and I met Jesus and here's my thing I wrote. I wrote the gospel of rain and oh, give right. me five tuppence and I'll sell it to yeah. you. And, uh, and it was so it was kind of like some of right, those right. were going around as well and they're vaguely Christian and stuff like that, but it was also some of guess, it is a scam. Yeah. And, I, and I guess a cynic, which I am not, would say, and that makes them different from the canonized gospels, how? Because these were, Ooh. again, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. Some of these Gospels are out there. I mean, out there. Especially some of these great stories about Jesus' teenage years. It turns out Jesus was a real jerk when he was a teenager. Uh, I mean, there's this one great story about how all these kids are playing in the streets and, and one kid uh, bumps into Jesus and knocks him down and Jesus gets up and turns him into stone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was kind of a, a, a kind of a petulant, wow, that's mean. a petulant teenager, um, and yes, I, I agree with you. A lot of these gospels were written not not to uh, demonstrate any kind of historicity, but to prove an argument because these people thought Jesus was something else, and then they wrote a gospel to prove what they thought Jesus was. But again, I just want to emphasize, that's what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John did too. They just did it earlier, much, much earlier. And so they're a little bit more valuable to a historian trying to get to Jesus, the man. In fact, I admit in my book that I don't really use John. The Gospel of John, to me, is not a great resource for getting to the historical Jesus. And that's the book that's most revered by the more evangelical side of the Christian church. The Gospel of John begins with, in arhe in hai lagos, kai ha lagos praston theon. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John's Jesus isn't even a person. I mean, John's Jesus is the eternal logos who was in heaven from the beginning of time, through whom all creation arose, and who very briefly came down to earth. And again, in this very, John's Jesus is the only Jesus who openly claims to be God. I and the Father are one, John's Jesus says. Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Jesus never make that kind of Well, he always referred to himself as a son of man. The son of God was put on to him. Right, At what point? Right. Son of God, again, Son of God is a title in first century Palestine. Lots of people are called Son of God. David is called Son of God. It's not a description. Only later on does it become understood as a description. It's a kingly title. So I don't use John that much. Uh, my primary resource when it comes to the Gospels is Mark, which was written in 70, the first Gospel. And then something which sounds like it's made up, and it very well may be made up, it is a hypothetical thing, but that scholars refer to as Q. Q is this theoretical text where, you know, we can be fairly certain that it existed, but we have no copies of it. 
Uh, Q, by the way, is, just stands for Quelle, which is Germ that's my terrible German accent. Uh, for it's German for source. That's what it means. And Q, as as the theory goes, around the year 50 or so, same time that Paul is writing his letters, there was this collection made of Jesus's quotes, like his greatest hits, all of all of his really you know his good sayings. And people wrote these things down and passed them along and they memorized them. Because, again, what was most important about Jesus is not so much the things that he did, but the things that he said. So they memorized his words and passed them around. Um, and then these words were turned into stories, is the best way that I can put it. I'll give an example of this that'll make more sense. Um, so... Okay, so there's this famous, famous part in, in the Gospels in which Jesus says uh, the Sabbath was not, I mean, man was not made for the Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for man. That was a, a, a line from Q, basically, right? So the, the early Christians would go around saying this, right? Sabbath was made for man, man was not made for Sabbath. And then when Mark sat down to write his Gospel, what he wanted to do was to express that thought in narrative form. So he said, one day Jesus and his disciples were walking through a field on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry, so they bent down and they picked these little bits of, of uh, grain, and they started eating them. And the Pharisees saw, and the Pharisees said, no, 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 uh, it's the Sabbath. How dare your, your disciples eat grains of, of wheat on the Sabbath? And Jesus said, the Sabbath, that man was not made for the Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for man. That's how the Gospels, were, that's how the Gospels must be understood, is that these are teachings of Jesus in narrative form. Mark was not, like all ancient people, was not so interested in the facts of that story. Did it actually happen? Maybe, maybe it did, maybe it didn't. But for Mark, that would have been inconsequential to the truth of that story, which is based on these words. So I use mostly Q, and how do we know what's in Q? It's weird and complicated, but it's basically the stuff that's in Matthew and Luke, but not in Mark. That's Q. Don't ask me to explain that any more than that. Uh, that's but nice that's, that's, that's what we use. Hi, thank you for uh, coming out tonight. I, I, I know just listening uh, on uh, Terry Gross the other day, you were talking about your own your own struggle with because you were in seminary school and everything and and uh, and kind of going through this process you were struggling trying to seek truth out and I know in my own walk that that's kind of my thing too where <laughs> I've, I'm trying to line up the facts with you know what's you know where's my faith at so just curious to hear um, about your kind of struggle with the yeah. resurrection and in my own stuff, I've found that that resurrection story actually goes back to ancient Sumaria, and did that, you know, kind of, yeah. that, where was the hold for you? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I talk about the resurrection a lot in the book, and what I admit from the beginning is that the resurrection is an unhistorical event, so the historian can say nothing about it. Uh, you know, we can just simply, depending on how you think, if you're a person of faith, you think, yeah, of course it happened. If you're not a person of faith, you think, well, that's crazy. But what I'm interested in is in what a historian can actually discuss, which is not the resurrection, but what I refer to as the resurrection experience. What is a matter of history is that very soon after Jesus' death, these followers claimed to have had this transcendent experience where they saw the risen Jesus. And that claim, which they went to their deaths, you know, uh, refusing to recant, was responsible for them continuing on this journey and ultimately transforming this religion into the largest religion in the world. That's a piece of history that you can actually talk about and analyze. The resurrection itself is purely a matter of faith. To your larger point about kind of the spiritual journey, however, 
is that I'm fairly unique amongst my colleagues in, in the history of religions because they're all atheists, right? I mean, here's the kind of uncomfortable fact is that most of my colleagues began their academic work as believers and then very quickly abandoned belief and began to study religions as though it was just a science, right? I mean, and I understand that. When you study the world's religions, the first thing that you realize is, oh, this is all just pretty much the same stuff. Like, they're all just saying the exact same thing. Uh, I mean, they're, in fact, they're saying it in the exact same way. It's the same myths, the same stories show up in, in peoples that are separated by thousands of years and thousands of miles. And one response to that would be, oh, so then it's just all bunk. Like, it's just all, you know, storytelling. Another response to that would be, well, maybe the reason that the answers are all the same is because they're all talking about the exact same experience, and that experience is valuable. It's real. You know, maybe the reason that we all talk about God the same way is because there's a God, and that's why we all talk about him in the same way. Um, and that's what I believe. But I also believe that if you want to commune with that God, if you want to actually have an experience of that transcendent reality, then you need help. Because by definition, that experience is inexpressible. It's undefinable. It's ineffable. You can't, oh, by the way, oh, those are all words. Uh, you can't, you can't, you, there, there are no words. It, it, again, it's by definition beyond the realm of human comp comprehension, what you're talking about. So what is religion? It's just a language to help you talk about it. That's it. It's just a series of symbols and metaphors. It's a language the way French is a language. If you and I were French, we would speak French and you would understand me. But if I were Chinese and you were French, you'd have no clue what the hell I was talking about. Same thing with religion. If you and I are evangelical Christians and I said to you, I've been washed by the blood of the lamb, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But if you were a Buddhist, you would think I was crazy. <laughs> it's just a way, it's just a language to help us talk to each other and talk to ourselves about this ineffable experience. That's all religion is. You talked about uh, James just upholding the Jewish law and on the other side, Paul doing away with it. How did their theologies differ in a historical context? And uh, what did they believe about God? And what did they believe about Jesus? Mm. How does that differ? Very, very good question. Well, Paul was a It's theologian. a pretty good question. <laughs> <laughs> Am I exaggerating? It's pretty good. We kind of covered it. It's pretty. It's, it's not okay. very, it's good. very good. I and appreciate I will, and it. I will answer it quickly. The I'm difference, just the difference between James and Paul, is not just in the way that they saw Jesus. James was an illiterate, uneducated peasant from Galilee, like his brother. He couldn't read or write, let alone expound on like complex theological doctrines. He was a Jew, a simple Jew who believed in Judaism, and he thought his brother was a Jew who also preached Judaism. Paul was an in incredibly educated, erudite, Greek-speaking Jew from one of the wealthiest port cities in Rome, Tarsus, uh, a former Pharisee, as he himself puts it. This was a man who was a theologian. And all you have to do is, is look at the difference between their letters. Paul is describing something enormously complicated. He has this vision of Jesus that is, I mean, it's, it's innovative. I mean, it's, well, it's what we now call Christianity. I mean, it was a, a, a completely new way of thinking about uh, the, the, the relationship between God and man. The very idea of the Christ as, as Paul referred to Jesus, which is the Greek word for Messiah, but that's not how Paul used it. Paul doesn't talk about Christ the way that the Hebrew prophets talked about Messiah. 
um, he thinks of Christ as this, again, this eternal being, this, this, this God-man uh, who is almost the beginning of a new genus of, of creation, and that anyone who believes in Jesus, who follows Jesus, can also have eternal life, be at one with God, judge all of humanity, and the angels, Paul says. The believers will be in a place where we will actually judge not just the rest of humanity, but the angels of heaven. Those were sophisticated things that would have gone way over James's head. I mean, this James was a woodworker. What, would, a what do you think, let's say Paul, first of all, part of Paul's beliefs came from his vision of, of Jesus on the road to Damascus, right? So For it's sure. not just conjecture, speculation. He had this transcendent experience yeah, exactly. this that experience he that saw that Jesus in a certain right. way and, that, and so uh, that was his motivation. But what would a Christianity have been like if uh, he had gotten killed by bandits on the road to Damascus? <laughs> and there was, there was no Paul. And there was just James. It, it's, I mean, obviously we have no idea, but what do you think would have happened? Do you think Christianity would have died on the vine and there was a couple hundred Christians serving yeah. the poor and then <laughs> yeah. the Romans came in a few year, years later and killed them all and it would have faded away to total obscurity? Now that's a good question. <laughs> and the answer is yes. I mean, let's just be honest. Yeah. If James had won that argument instead of Paul, there'd really be no Christianity today. Uh, it may be an offshoot of Judaism, yeah. uh, but it would have it would have more or less kind of faded away. It I'm certainly good. would not be what it is today. I am today. very good. Yes, <laughs> young lady. I was wondering if you could give us your interpretation as, as far as why it took so long for the Gospels to be written in the first place. And secondly, your argument about Jesus not confronting Rome, how would you reconcile Jesus's, Jesus when he said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's? Thank you. Let me start with that, that moment because that's actually probably the most important moment in Jesus's life in understanding who he truly was. There's this experience where at the end of his ministry, Jesus has this triumphal entry into Jerusalem flanked by a frenzied multitude shouting Hosanna, declaring that the king has arrived. Incredibly provocative move on Jesus' part. He immediately after that, or actually the next day after that, goes to the temple and he cleanses it, as, as the term is used, by which we mean he attacks it. He turns over the tables of the money changers and the, and the money lenders. He breaks open the cages, holding the animals for sacrifice. Uh, and and he, he tries to in his words, you know, cleanse this, this temple, which is a treasonable offense because the temple is not just the center of the Jewish cult, it's also the presence of the Roman Empire. I mean, the governor of Rome, uh, the, the, the Roman governor of Jerusalem, and, and his legions of troops live in the Antonia Fortress attached to the temple. So this is by every scholar who studies the Bible, this is the moment in which Jesus uh, becomes Plus the arrested. Roms get a big cut. They get of, a huge cut. Of so the does sacrifices the and the tithes to the priests. Huge amount like of money pouring through the temple. Yeah, and everybody gets a little piece of it. Absolutely. Um, and then, after these two major events, these two treasonable acts on Jesus' part, the Jews decide that they're going to trick him, the Bible says, right? The Gospels say. And this is how they're going to do it. They go up to him and they say, Master, you, you seem like a pretty good guy. You're honest. You know, we have a question for you. Should we pay the tribute to Rome or not? Now, understand that this is not a question. It's a trap. In fact, the Gospels say it's a trap. Because in Jesus' time, the, quintos, the quintessential mark of zealotry was the refusal to pay the tribute. And I won't talk about the whole history of that, but that was it. What marked a zealot from every other Jew in Palestine is zealots thought that the tribute was an abomination. The, the tribute in, in, in the eyes of the zealots was proof, was an admission that the land belonged not to God, but to Rome. So Rome feels as though it, it, that the land is its personal property and it demands a tribute for it. The zealots believe that the land belonged to God and paying the tribute was a 
was, a, was apostasy. That's actually the term that they would use. It was apostasy. So when they say, should we pay the tribute or not, they're, they're not, that's not what they're asking. What they're saying is, are you a zealot or not? Jesus says, show me the denarius coin. And that's the, that's the coin that the, that the Jews use to pay the tribute. He takes the coin and he looks at it and he says, whose face is this and whose name is on this coin? And they say, that's Caesar's face and it's Caesar's name. And then Jesus says this phrase, which for some reason ever since the King James Bible has been understood in English as render unto, because that's not what it means. Apodidomi, the Greek word that he uses there, is translated as give back to, give back to, not render onto. He says, well then give back to Caesar that which is Caesar and give back to God that which is God's. What is God's? The land is God's. What he's saying is that, yeah, sure, to give this tribute to Caesar, it's his coin, his name is stamped on it. But give the land back to God because it's his land. That's about as zealous a statement as you can make in first century Palestine. And what happens immediately afterwards? He goes to Gethsemane, and that's where he's arrested for the crime of refusing to pay tribute. That becomes one of his, when, when he's standing before uh, the, the high priest Caiaphas, and they're reading all these charges against him. He attacked the temple. He claimed to be the Messiah. One of the charges is, oh, and he refused to pay the tribute. There's a code word in there. You refuse to pay the tribute, you're a zealot. I think. I think. And, and just the part about why did it take so long to write the gospel? Oh, right. Uh, I mean, look, they, they did write stuff down. I mean, you know, Paul wrote his letter starting in around 48. Q, if that existed, was probably around 50. Um, but frankly, I think probably people assumed that there was no need to write this stuff down until Jerusalem was destroyed, until the temple was gone, and until the first church, the church founded by James uh, after Jesus' death was destroyed. And then it was probably a good idea well, to most start of the, writing this stuff down. And most of the people were illiterate and poor and outcasts and... Right. All of the apostles were illiterate. The disciples were illiterate. So the oral tradition that had been going on for thousands of years before that was you pass this on to the generations. That's right. Through storytelling. I should write a book about Jesus. Um, on this note, I think it's time to end. Uh, thank you very much for coming, and let's give a big round of applause to Reza. Thank you.